This is the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 9th, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and it's been an interesting week in taxes, and one that actually whose major development is one we had kind of predicted here on this program back in April. But we had it confirmed this week by the IRS after a long period of being told that guidance was coming soon. Well, soon finally arrived. So let's talk about what's going on this week. First, one key issue we're going to have this week is that the IRS is going to issue guidance for the third and fourth quarter employee retention credit. And that was one we were expecting, but along with it came much more significant guidance on the employee retention credit as a whole. And in there was some news that basically tells you exactly what we had told you back in March about how the ERC was going to work for majority shareholders, but also has some other items that are a combination of good news, bad news about the IRS interpreting the program for the entire period or for just 2021. And then, as I said, looking at some basics for what changes in the fourth quarter. So we'll look at that. We also had this week the IRS publishing a memorandum that emphasizes the IRS's position about what needs to be in your conservation easement extinguishment clauses if you're going to try to get a deduction for a qualified conservation easement. The IRS is emphasizing a recent tax court win they had and saying that if your document looks like the document in that case or is reasonably like it, that you're going to have your deduction disallowed. That's going to be their point. I don't think it's terribly surprising, but it is a reminder that, yeah, the IRS plans to make use of that. Finally, we'll talk about a case we discussed in November of 2019, a tax court loss by a best-selling author that was looking at trying to convert a good chunk of her publishing contracts to non-self-employment income. What we'll talk about this time is that she lost at the tax court. She took her case up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and we'll discuss yet again she didn't prevail. So we'll talk about what that means and what it means about self-employment income in general and maybe some of the ways we tend to think about self-employment income in a way that's not really what the law says. So we have to be very, very careful. In fact, in many ways, this entire program is dealing with issues, or maybe at least a good chunk of the program, is dealing with issues where people have tried to kind of figure out what makes sense, not necessarily had tried to figure out what the law said, and that's come and bitten them hard, potentially in some cases. So we'll talk about how this works. So let's get on to the first issue this week, which is the IRS's Notice 2021-49 was issued on August the 4th. It is a 34-page document that talks about the employee retention credit. Remember, we first got that in the CARES Act. It was extended at the end of this of the end of 2020 for six months, and then as part of the Uh, American Rescue Plan Act, it was extended again for the last six months of this year. Now, as a little caveat here, while it's been extended while on books right this instant, it's been, it's around till the end of this year for all parties. It may very well not be around much longer for anybody except a recovery startup business. They may, in essence, everybody else who got it because of reduction in revenue or because of being shut down may lose the ERC as of the end of this quarter. So that's, though, still to be determined. I'm recording this on Friday. Supposedly, the Senate is going to hold an all-nighter if need be and get this thing voted on to get it out of the Senate. So we'll see what exactly happens there. And if we do, sometime next week, have the bill actually out. There aren't a lot of IRC provisions in there, but there are some, and this is one of them that's in there. So as I say, this contains guidance for the final six months, or as I said, maybe three months for most taxpayers of the of the employer retention credit and the provisions that apply to all employee retention credit quarters, or at least the 2021 two sets of laws that we have in place. 
So as I said, we knew we were waiting on that first batch there, the items that would be the fourth quarter employee retention, third and fourth quarter employee retention credit, because we got last year, you know, we got early this year in March, we got the guidance on the 2020 version as modified at the end of the year. Then a month later, we got the guidance on the second quarter. Well, we're now essentially a month plus through the third quarter. So they've now issued that third and fourth quarter guidance for the ERC. And we'll talk a little bit about this. Now, especially some of the changes that we're going to find in that section that involves the entire ERC, where those are going to lead to some changes in potentially already filed 941Xs may need to be revised again. And it can be for good news or bad news. And we'll talk about both because I think there are some surprising results in here that are taxpayer friendly. And there are some surprising results in here, at least for certain people, that are going to be very, very taxpayer unfriendly. So we'll talk about that. I think the, mo the one most people are going to think was the taxpayer unfriendly decision is the one that was the least surprising to me of anything in here. But as I said, we already kind of talked about that one. We will go over it again in today's session. And the real problem is, as I noted, we talked about last in March, March, I guess, early April. I did a whole segment on the related party rules and the employee retention credit and the problem I referred to as splashback, where owners, controlling owners of the S corporation and their spouses would tend to find that due to the mechanics of how the provision works, in almost every case, and essentially every case where they do not have, you know, where they have any living relative that's reasonably close, they'll end up being unable to claim their wages as part of their employee retention credit claim. They can claim the wages on unrelated employees, but they cannot claim it on their relatives, which was not controversial at all, at least in terms of nobody was surprised about that. Everybody thought that rule was there, but also on themselves due to the concept we call splashback. So if you remember our discussion back in April about this, uh, and I know at that time I got a lot of emails from people. I got other con you know people in comments and threads in various places saying, well, no, that doesn't make sense. I read here or I read there that this was all okay and you could claim it on those people or I read here or there that, well, it's an open question. My theory had always been the code was very clear on how this works. There was no ambiguity. And so it didn't really matter about anything else. You need ambiguity in the code before you can start moving outside the code. And the only place I found any possible wiggle room would be if the IRS decided to use the rule similar clause uh, to try to claim, well, similar isn't identical, so we're going to carve out an exception. They didn't go there. I think they didn't go there because they were very, very concerned they're opening Pandora's box for other cases of stock attribution under 267 that, you know, could cause them problems in other parts of the code because they'd have to explain, well, why is it here that it works this way, but not there? The code says, you know, you use 267C rules to determine ownership, and you had said, well, it doesn't work this way. You know, this is how that works. And I think they were very concerned about it. So bottom line, splashback is a real problem. The majority owners, and we'll discuss what I mean by splashback, but splashback is a real problem. In most cases, with very, very limited exceptions, there will be no credit for any wages paid to a majority owner of an S or C corporation. Uh, we could say it would also apply to partnerships, but remember, you can't be an employee of a partnership if you're the partner. So for practical purposes, partnerships wouldn't be true. But if the spouse is an employee, the spouse is all, also going to have trouble in any entity. And we'll talk about the relatives in general that get lost. And I will point you to an article I posted just today before I put before I actually recorded this session that's on our current federal tax .com website that essentially after we get done with everything I'll discuss here today just has the step-by-step -step way you'll go through to find out the people you cannot claim the credit on 
due to the related party rules, at least due to two major portions of that. There are still some other ways you could trip up, but I think the two I'm going to discuss are going to be the major two that are going to cause most small businesses problems. Okay, let's talk about this. In essence, the related individual rules go like this, right? We're going to apply rules similar to those found at 51I1 of the code. That's part of the work opportunity credit. And what you have to understand, fundamentally, boiling that down and that article back from April, I think it was April 4th. Uh, if you go read that article, that article will tell you exactly why it works this way. I'll give it a more summarized version of today. But the bottom line is, barred our wages, and this is very simple. Anybody who is related under 152D2A through G, uh, pause for just a second and tell you that actually the notice says A through H, but the code clearly only limits it to G. So we'll talk a little bit about what that distinction is, but there is one category of relative, who really isn't a relative, that will not disqualify you for claiming wages you pay to that person even though the notice says it does, because the notice went one step beyond. Bottom line, in the levels of authority, there is no question unambiguous code, be, unambiguous code beats everything, and it clearly beats a notice. So we're going to be fine with that one group. Okay, And the other catch, the relatives of the owner, this is the fundamental problem because of that determined under 267C clause. Remember, Barred our wages from those related to a majority owner as terminal 267C. And the problem is relatives, most relatives that are at all close relatives, are going to be deemed to own every share that a shareholder owns. That means for majority owner, not only are they a controlling shareholder, but every one of their relatives becomes a controlling shareholder for this purpose. And that's going to become a problem because that will basically bring into the mix the owner uh, because the owner will be a disqualified relative of their relative who has become a controlling shareholder under these rules. Right. So bottom line, we talk about this. The owner is a barred relative for one or more of these deemed owners. So, for instance, simple example, the one I used in the April setup, my brother. If I own 100% of the S corporation, my brother owns 100% of the S corporation. Now we take those. Now we take a look at that. Under the rules for who's not allowed, generally, again, if you're a majority owner, majority control, so we go through this list of who counts. And if you look at that, on that list under 267C, my family, and there's going to be problems with family. There's also some issues with partnership we'll talk about maybe briefly here. But the family of an individual that we are going to consider to own every share that person does includes the brother and sister, whether by whole or half-blood, the spouse, the ancestors, father, mother, grandparent, etc., and the lineal descendants, child, grandchild, great-grandchild. So as I said, pretty much anybody vaguely related to you, right? Your brother, your sister, right? We have to get outside your immediate family in order to get away from this group. They will be deemed to own every share you do. And what we have to do is take all of these 100% owners, as we'll discuss, and then we'll have to say, well, since these 100% owners, anybody having one of the relationships found in 152DA2G um, is going to be considered to be somebody who, if they're paid wages, can those wages paid by the corporation cannot be included for the employer retention credit. That includes your child or a descendant of a child. So again, child, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, Father, mother, ancestor of either. So again, I get your grandparents, great grandparents, whatever. Stepfather or stepmother, uh, niece or nephew. Now this branches out even further in that regard. Aunt or uncle, a son-in-law, daughter-in-law, father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, or sister-in-law. And that last category is what's going to be fatal to the wife of the owner. 
because that's going to bring in the cross-reference we, we come up, come down. So I take all my relatives, right? Take my brother. My brother, okay, fine. He's 100% owner. Now, we take a look at all of his relatives. I'm on that list because I'm his brother. And if I were married, my wife would be on that list because essentially she would be his sister-in-law. And therefore, share wages paid by my S corporation would be not allowed for ERC. And my wages paid by my S corporation would not be allowed for my IRC because my brother's alive. And it's not just my brother, right? My parents are in there, right? They're in there. Any children are in there. I mean, we have to find somebody with none of these relatives for that owner's wages to be allowed for the ERC. And that's simply not going to happen very often. As I say, normally this problem will impact the spouse as well, you know, because essentially almost anybody that I attribute to, you know, if it makes that in-law list, we got problems. Or if it's my child, it's got a problem, you know, because the spouse will have the relationship with the child. That's going to be a similar problem, will be a relative right, will be one of the relatives, mother, stepmother of that child. Now we got a problem, right? The one way out of this is to have nobody on that list. You have to have no living individual, you know, children, descendants, brothers, sisters, um, ancestors, uh, nieces, nephews, uh, aunts or uncles, and son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, father-in-laws, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, or sister-in-law. I've got to be, you know, I can't have any of those kind of related to me. And I really can't have anybody under two, six, and I should say the real list there is a 267C list. What I really can't have is I can't have any living brothers or sisters, ancestors, lineal descendants, or spouse. Because even the spouse, if I don't have any relatives, but my spouse's parents are alive, I'm going to get in trouble under the in-law rule. So I need to have no living relatives. If I have no living 267C relatives, then I can claim the deduction. And if neither I nor my spouse do, then we can both claim it in that realm. Right? I've got to watch for the backdoor approach. Now, there still may be other ways we get in trouble, which we'll talk about briefly, but that's the main ways, right? No living relatives is the key exception to this, right? So we have that. And, you know, and it also creates a problem if no owner holds a majority and the owners are related. So let's say we have this company, it's a family company, it passed on to, you know, the four kids, two brothers, two sisters, everyone owns 25%. That's great, except brother one essentially is attributed every share owned by brother two, three, four. You know, brother, brother two, and then sister one and two. And the same thing for everybody else. They're attributed all the shares of their siblings. And now brother one is the brother of every other 100% shareholder. So we're going to lose all of them via that mechanism. And there's even a quirky problem if all four are unrelated. But as is often the case, they end up, let's say, operating their construction company as an S corporation, but they also have a, you know, the office building that the construction company works out of. That's owned by the four by the four shareholders in a separate partnership in which they are each partners because we keep buildings out of the corporation. Well, you're going to find one of the attribution rules is if you own stock in a corporation and your partner owns stock in that same corporation, you're deemed to own every share that the other partner owns. So that will cause the problem that every one of those people will become 100% shareholders. Now, the advantage here is, okay, they're not related to each other. And the second advantage is, we don't have to worry much about splashback because one of the special rules with that, or one of the rules that matters here is, okay, I only really own 25%, but I'm under 267C deemed on 100%. However, under a special rule found at uh, C5, 
any stock I only attribute to my son, my daughter, my wife, you know, my parents, etc., stock I actually own. I do not attribute stock that was attributed to me under the partnership rule or the family rule. So only shares they worry about is that 25% I own. Now I should say, you know, that essentially, right? So the only exception is if it's attributed under number one, stock owned by or for a corporation, partnership, or trust, right, is considered being owned proportionally by or for its shareholders, partners, or beneficiaries. So if that, if you get the proportionate allocation under those rules where you don't own stock, you know, the corporation owns stock and you're allocated that way, that's the only stock that gets reattributed down to somebody else. So that's a little quirk in the rule. But yeah, so that structure where you have an S corporation, you know, and we put the building in a partnership and all of the shareholders of the S corporation hold interest in the partnership, that's going to cause you a problem even if every shareholder is unrelated. So that's another problem in this mess. Now, the IRS actually provides for us four separate examples. And they're in the story. They're in basically the posting we have on the website. And they're in the materials you can download that we always post up every week in our PDF version. There's a first example that looks at a parent and child shareholder. And that first example says corporation owns own 80% by um, a father or let's say, or maybe mother and daughter. We just know they're individual ENF. So let's say mother and daughter. 80% is owned by the mom, 20% by the daughter, right? It's an eligible employer. They both are going to be deemed on 100% because, of course, you, know, you allocate from child to parent and from parent to child. And as well, they're both 100% shoulders, and each one shows up on the other's list of relatives for which we cannot claim the credit. So we cannot claim the credit for either the parent's wages or even the 20% kid who is the 20% owner child. Example two, this one is also one that I've heard people get confused about. I've been asked this right away. I said, nope, it doesn't matter. And I said this when we talked about it back in April. So now we have a case of a corporation is owned 100% by dad, right? Um, son is the child of dad. Son has nothing to do with the corporation, right? Nothing at all to do with the corporation. Nothing to do with dad. Maybe he and dad had a falling out ages ago. They don't talk to each other. But the fact that son is alive, and let's assume dad has no other relatives living, but son's alive. The shares from dad will be attributed to son, right? Son does not work in the corporation at all. It has nothing to do with the corporation. Son is also, because people ask me this, what if son is not a minor? It doesn't matter. Nothing in 267C says a word about any of these relatives being minors. That share, Those shares are attributed to son. And now dad is a barred relative of son. He's the father. Right? He's on the list. Father's on the list. So dad's wages are barred because the son is alive. Okay, That's an interesting aside under these rules. Now, example three gets some people excited, but they miss the point of example three. Example three talks about C corporations owned by individual J. You know, it's an eligible employer with the calendar year, with, you know, with the year in question, married individual K, and they have no family members as defined in 267C4. That's the key point of this example. They have no living relatives. In that case, yes, they eat, we get to claim the credit on both the wages of the owner of the corporation, let's say Mary, and Mary's husband, who maybe is Wayne. We get to claim it because there are no living relatives. Yes, Mary's stock ownership is attributed over to Wayne, but that's not a problem because spouses aren't in the list of dependents that we're testing for. So even though they're both 100% deemed owners, it's irrelevant because, either, because both of them essentially don't have any relatives, so there's nobody 
to splash back the ban onto them. So that's the interesting part of this. And then example four talks about that case where we have three individuals here, but they're all related. So in this case, we have, you know, all of these, the three owners are siblings. They each own one third of the company. The problem is going to be each one is going to be deemed on 100% because they're going to be deemed on every share their sibling owns. And their sibling will then, you know, they're, they're going to be on the list of their sibling because each one has 100%. They're going to be on the banned list for the other two siblings, which means we can't claim their wages. That is the splashback problem. Okay, we send those shares out under 267C, then we take that list of majority owners and we're looking for the barred relatives of each one of those people. And almost without exception, that majority owner is going to end up on the barred list, or in this case, with a family company, maybe second, third generation, where all the shareholders are related, they're still going to wipe each other out. You know, it's the way this works. Fair or not, it's how it's working. Okay. So we'll talk about this. Let's talk about the steps now. Right? There are a number of steps to go here. First, here's what is. We're just talking to mechanics. And this is kind of what that extra article on the website discusses. So you might want to go get that. But what we're going to do, we're going to compile a list of deem owners of each owner of the corporation stock. So I need to go back to 267C and for e C4 and for each owner, I want to list any living uh, brother, sister, and it can be a half brother, half sister as well. Uh, the spouse, obviously we know that that'll be there. Any living ancestor and any living dependent, or I should say, or descendant, not dependent. Doesn't have to be a dependent. I list every one of those, right? And I do that for every shareholder. Once I've done that, now I go back for everybody, right? For everybody, and I start looking at how much, how many shares are they deemed to own? So, you know, if somebody's on two shareholders list, I'm going to add the shares for each of those shareholders onto the list. And when I'm done, I'm going to take a look, and everybody on the list is going to have so many shares they're deemed to own. It may all come from one shareholder, or it may come from multiple shareholders, but we're going to find those. I then take that list, and I want to knock off that list everybody who doesn't have more than 50% ownership on the 267C calculation. So I get myself limited to the list of those that, after we do that rule, and apply that deemed ownership. I'm going to combine actual and deemed ownership for every one of those people. And I'm going to compare that to the number of shares outstanding. If that number is more than 51%, you know, more than 50% of those shares outstanding, that person stays in the list. And now from that list of control individuals, many of whom have no ownership at all in the company, and many of whom have nothing to do with the company, but I still need that list. From that, I compile a list of the relatives of each. And if any of those people are on the payroll, we cannot claim the employee retention credit on that employee's wages. Okay, so we need to get those people have to be taken off the list. As I mentioned back in April, you know, we talked about, or we mentioned earlier this year, we talked about optimizing between the ERC and the PPP loan. These are going to be, these are wages we're going to direct toward PPP loan forgiveness because we can't use them for ERC, right? They can use them for PPP loan forgiveness. They're still fine there. We just can't use them for ERC. So these are the basic steps you're going to go through to make that work. I know you're going to complain. It's unfair. It's crazy. But mechanically, there is no question this is how it works. And I say that because a number of us have independently developed the exact criteria, except for we didn't throw H in there, the, the extra dependent. By the way, that H extra dependent is the dependent. Everything else is in the list. The one that the IRS includes that shouldn't be in there in the notice is H. And that is an individual who, you know, for the taxable year had the same place of a bonus as a taxpayer 
and is a member of the household. So that's the unrelated person that's living with you in the household. You know, so that's, as I say, if you have a significant other to whom you are not married, right? No, no marriage, but you have a significant other living with you, the old quote unquote living in sin, that person is fine. They're not in this mix. That's not a bar. I, I can pay relatives to that. Another marriage penalty here in most cases. I can pay wages to that person. And as long as that person's not related to any of my relatives, I'm going to be fine with the wages paid to my live-in that I'm not married to. That'll be fine. Or anybody else in the household. Could be kids. Could be anything else. It could be anybody that you're, you know, it's living there with you as part of your household. They're fine. You know, that's what the IRS added. That's a mistake. I'm going to assume the IRS will probably correct that because it's kind of an obvious error. But we'll, we'll see that going forward. Okay. So let's talk about some of the other rules now. You know, I'm going to know how much you're going to love that rule. So let's talk about some of the other rules that are in place here that apply to all of the periods. One that most people aren't going to like is the timing of the disallowed deduction on wages. The law says that if you claim the ERC, you must reduce the wages you use to claim the ERC by the amount of the credit. Okay, that's how it goes. Now, as you know, we didn't even know we could get the 2020 credit on anybody that got a PP loan until December 27th. And certainly we'd already filed, you know, two full quarters that could have been ERC wages, the second and third. And we probably didn't have time to figure this all out because the IRS didn't release guidance until March on the fourth quarter. So almost everybody was filing 941Xs in 21 to get their credit for 20. And if they're a calendar year taxpayer, obviously their year ends December 31st, 2020. And, you know, you're going to pay tax based on your income for that year. And you're going to deduct those wages in 2020. What a lot of people wanted to be able to do, and they said, especially if they were cash basis, was saying, well, I don't care that we're deducting the wages in 2020. We're just going to go ahead and pick up the refund as income in 21. IRS says, mm, it's not how it works. They said the law is very clear. It has to be the years the wages are incurred and deducted on the return is the year you have to reduce the deduction. You do not get a wait until the year you receive the refund. That is, so if you've already filed the 2020 return and you didn't go on extension, you filed timely, you got to amend. Or even worse, if it was a BBA partnership and, you know, it could require an amended return, I should say could acquire an and basically an administrative adjustment request for a BBA partnership. And as we discussed last week, that gets very, very messy, and it's going to become a tax credit that's had to be claimed on a 21 return, and you just hope like mad, you know, that everybody, all partners are going to have enough income in 21 to absorb the credit. So that's also in play. Again, I think the IRS is correct in this interpretation. Uh you know, because I, I think because the law is pretty clear, you got to reduce the deduction. And the deduction was clearly on the 20 return. So you got to reduce the deduction. And they're not going to allow you to roll it forward and just treat it like it's a 21 item because the law doesn't do that. Let's get to some good news then. First thing is, and I've had more than a few people get concerned about this with me. What happens if this is talking about the alternative quarter election in 2021? As you know, for the 2021 credits, both of them, the first six months, the last six months, or last or third quarter, whichever one that ends up being, you're able to claim the credit if you have a reduction in revenue either for the quarter that you want to claim the credit in or the quarter before that. Now, the question some people had was, well, let's say I didn't have a drop in revenue in Q4 2020 versus Q4 2019. But, you know, revenues dropped in Q1 2021. Okay? So I had the drop. I had a significant enough drop in quarter one 2021. So I used quarter one 2021 to claim the credit I could not have used quarter four of 2020. 
Now we come to quarter two of 2021. In quarter two, my business rebounded. I no longer have the dro sufficient drop in revenue in the second quarter. Now I've already claimed a credit based on Q1's drop in revenue. The question becomes, can I also claim the credit in Q2 based on that same Q1 drop in revenue? Can I essentially make it do double duty? And the answer is, as the IRS notes per the law, yes. You will get the credit under that fact situation for Q1 and Q2. Okay, there because there is no bar, you do not have to consistently use the same election. You can elect. Even though you use the Q1 drop in revenue to get the credit in Q1, you can still refer the Q1 drop in revenue to get yourself the credit in Q2. That was kind of how this was built. And that's oddly because they changed the basic way of computing drop in revenue and how that section works. But it oddly is meant to be equivalent with the 2020 version where you still got the credit in the quarter when your revenues went above 80%. So it, it's a vague kind of way of making that work similarly with the way they worked at this time. There's another one here that I think some people may have fouled up on restaurants. You might wonder about what about the tips that the employees get in the restaurant? Can I claim the employee retention credits on tips that the customers gave to the employees? And if you just think, quote unquote, logically is what people tell me, the answer is, well, of course not. You didn't pay the tips, right? Why would you get a credit for something you didn't pay for? But the way the law is written, the law allows the credit on anything defined as wages. And as the IRS points out, if you have cash tips, tips paid in cash, that are more than $20 in a month for an employee, those tips are wages. And that means you do get to claim the employee retention credit on those tips. Well, how about if you claim the credit for tips under Section 45B? Now, we know we've got to reduce the wage deduction if we claim that, right, on the income tax return. And we also know there's a whole bunch of credits that we've seen that if you claim those credits, you cannot claim the ERC as well. But the IRS notes this credit is not on the list of credits that if you claim it, you can't get the ERC. And secondly, um, the mere fact that we have to reduce the wages for income tax deduction purposes does not mean you reduce them for ERC computation purposes. So you will get the tips count as potentially qualified wages. Even if you claim the tip reduction credit, you still get to claim the full amount of the tips potentially to get your employee retention credit computed upon. So if you did a restaurant and you left the tips out, you've left money on the table. You know, unless these people got over 10,000. I suspect in a lot of restaurants, that's not going to happen for a lot of your staff that's part-time and not very highly paid. I suspect there's going to be some significant tip uh, numbers out there that you might want to take a look at. The IRS also gave a relatively taxpayer-friendly, I don't think anybody really got concerned about this, issue of when full-time employees and full-time equivalents count. The IRS clarified that for purposes of determining if you are a large or small employer, that average you know, number of employees back in 2020, or in 20, yeah, 2019, I should say, that's actually determined using the same rules effectively for counting full-time employees, but not full-time equivalents on average for 2019 that you do for the Affordable Care Act rules. But you don't worry about the full-time equivalents. Don't take the equivalents calculation. So if you have, let's say for this year, 2021, where a small employer would be 500 more employees, let's say you have 490 employees just counting full-time employees. When you throw in the equivalents, you have 550. You're still going to be a small employer because 490 is your average number back in 2019 because we only look at full-time employees, not full-time equivalents. However, you still get to claim the ERC on wages you pay to part-time employees that aren't full-time employees under the ACA's definition that we have wages you paid this year. So it basically works both ways for you. So that's kind of nice, right? We have that in there. So that's useful. Now, also, they say, you may remember from last time, we had special rules 
about how you did and quarters you referenced if an employer came into business or came into existence in 2019, how we computed them for the ERC in 2020. Uh, they say, look, those rules just carry over except for the 21 quarters. We're going to look at people that came into existence in 2020. And that'll be how we'll make those computations and how we'll work it. So if you have that situation, you can go back and look at the guidance on the original ERC and then just roll that into 2020. For people to start in 2020, you're going to use that rule, but apply it to 2020, not 2019. That'll be the way that one runs. Now, the end of this, we come up with the final uh, six months of 2021 you know, basically the third and fourth quarter guidance. Uh, a lot of this, some of this is really not very relevant. Mechanically, there is a change in which taxes, for reasons that make sense to Congress, instead of offsetting the employer portion of Social Security with the quote-unquote non-refundable part of the credit, this time we're going to offset the Medicare tax, the employer Medicare tax only, with the non-refundable credit. That means the 941 mechanically changes in the third quarter, but the ultimate result doesn't. You're still going to take the total ERC and reduce your payroll tax deposit you'd otherwise make. Yeah, but the mechanics are there, and so how you fill it out is going to look different, but ultimately you should have the same result. And no, don't ask me why Congress went that way. I'm sure there's a reason for funding or, you know, whatever's going on, maybe paying into Medicare. They've already paid into Social Security for this. They're going to do Medicare. They remind you that the limits and the amounts of the credit stay basically the same. You know, 70% on $10,000 per quarter, except they do say, but there will be a special limit for the amount of credit that can be claimed by recovery startup businesses. And as we say, the hitch now is, uh, obviously, we could have a change where only recovery startup business wages are going to count in the fourth quarter. That's at least what appears to be planned. Now, Congress had a glitch, imagine that, in drafting. And they actually never defined qualified startup business wages as qualified wages. Well, the IRS says, okay, look, the whole thing makes no sense unless they are. So we're going to take it to mean that any wages paid by a qualified startup business um, during you know, a period they're claiming under that are going to count as qualified wages. And again, everything's subject to the no more than $50,000 rule, but that's how this one's going to play. They also had some more discussion there about how you compute severely financially distressed employers. The IRS wasn't totally clear about, or I should say Congress wasn't, about which quarters you use for computing the wages at a get. IRS says, look, we're just going to go ahead. If you're a financially distressed employer for quarter three, we're going to use your wages paid in quarter three, not your wages paid in quarter two. There is a way you could read the law to suggest it was quarter two. They say, no, we think it's pretty clear what they meant was three. It's ambiguous. We're going to interpret it as three, right? We're going to do it in the current quarter you're claiming. That's the one that is a large employer but has more than a 90% drop in revenue versus the same quarter the year before. Also, for that for that drop in revenue, we're using the same rules as we use for the 20% drop. So none of that changes. Same references to good old 481C rules, right? They also provide the PPP rules will stay the same. So that same problem we had before, you can't use the same wages as we know to get a PPP forgiveness and to claim the ERC. But that same problem is if you if wages are listed on the forgiveness form, okay, you can only take them off and use them for ERC if you can show that that loan would have gotten the same re the basically the same forgiveness with no other changes but pulling those wages. You can't add expenses to the form. That's still there. So again, if your clients are doing forgiveness forms right now, make sure they throw every expense on there, right? Make sure they optimize because this is important. You don't want to take the easy way out and say, I'm just going to throw on the W-2 wages because we have way more than enough of that to get forgiveness. That's true in many cases, but you potentially are taking a huge hit on employee retention credits. 
if you do that. So make sure you list every expense. The last expenses you want to go on there are any wages that are allowed for ERC. You want to delay that until, you know, if, okay, leave all of them off initially and see if we could qualify and only, and if we can't, put just enough on to get yourself qualified for that purpose, right? We're going to do that. It also interestingly reminds us that while they extended the statute to five years uh, for anybody claiming the ERC, it was only it applies to the third and fourth quarter filings. So the filings previously will have the standard three-year statute, but if you file for it for this quarter or whoever qualifies next quarter, um, you're going to have a five-year statute. The IRS can come back after you for up to five years to recover the funds that were used for this. So, yep, it's big. As I say, this was something it upset. I'm sure people are getting, I've had things already, people getting upset about it. Um, you know, my problem is, as I said back in April, I don't see there's another way to read the rules aside from what they did for relatives. So be aware of that. Right, what we're doing there, that, that's kind of the problem with this. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about a couple of other developments this week because hey, we're getting into some time issues. We'd like to have this be less than an hour, so we'll go for that. We're going to talk about briefly about Chief Counsel Advice 2021 30014. Okay. This is a Chief Counsel Advice dealing with something the IRS has been taking to court a lot qualified conservation easements. And what they're talking about here specifically is conservation easement extinguishes clauses. Under regulation 1.170A-14G6AA, I love references like that, it says that if we have one of these issues where the easement is extinguished, you know, for per reasons out of the control of the taxpayer and the charity, for instance, because, let's say, you know, the city decides they're going to take over all that land and, I don't know, put a big parking lot in, whatever they're going to do. So they're going to use, under eminent domain, they're going to seize all the property and they'll pay for this. You have to say, if that happens and it's ordered to happen, right? It's a judicial order type thing that's ordered to happen. Then the charity has to get of the proceeds from selling that property an amount that is equal to the proportion of the deduction that was that was allowed, you know, the value of the easement when you claim the deduction compared to the value of the total property at that date. Now, what the IRS is doing is they're going back and they're looking at a win they had in 2016 on the Carroll case. In the Carroll case, the IRS argued, the taxpayer tried to say, well, okay, you know, we gave this property, you know, back then we gave this conservation easement, but we nevertheless have done major league improvements to the building that were consistent with the easement. And their conservation easement agreement said that when if we did have this thing sold, you know, under this extinguishment situation, that we would take away first from the proceeds of the sale the value of the, you know, of basically of the improvements or at least the appreciation related to the improvements. So that would come out of the mix. It wouldn't be considered part of the value that's going to then have the percentage applied to it to figure out what to give to the charity. In the Carroll case, the IRS won that case, and the court said that does not meet the requirements. This CCA makes clear the question is still coming up, and the IRS position is, yeah, we're following Carroll. So don't try to, don't try to argue that you can include that sort of improvement clause. Well, you can try it, but it's a public tax court decision. That means at a minimum, you're going to have to take it up to the Court of Appeals to win this one or go to the Court of Claims. And again, those get expensive or your district court, pay the tax and do Court of Claims or District Court, and probably will need to go up to the relevant Court of Appeals. So, yeah, clients need to be aware that those clauses, you know, are you really, really desperate to have that clause? And if you are, are you willing to pay the significant legal fees? Will have to be paid if the IRS challenges this because the IRS is not going to give on this, right? That's basically what the chief counsel's office is telling us is, nope, we plan to push this one. No, don't, don't you dare concede this in the field, right? We're, we're pushing this. So be aware of that. Doesn't mean you can't win, 
but it means you have to understand that it's going to be a probably a longer and more expensive path to winning than you might otherwise have hoped. Finally, we're going to consider the appeal in the case of Slaughter versus Commissioner, uh, which is case number 20-10786 from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. The opinion was issued on August the 3rd. Now, this is a case we covered back in late 2019. Uh, this is the case of Karen Slaughter. She is a best-selling crime fiction author. Some of you may have read her books. Okay, well, she gets contracts, obviously, from publishers to write books every year. And she also does a lot of promotional moves and other things. She also licenses to, the, to various publishers the right to use her likeness, for instance, on the covers, right? Use her name. In all, of their pub, in all their advertising and various things they write up, and also have access to use her characters for various things. So she gets paid for all of these items. Now, Karen, in the year in question, had some, you know, reasonably significant, because again, she is a very successful author. So she had publishing contracts in the first year under exam of income of $5.4 million and $3.6 million in the second year. And what she was trying to claim was that a portion of that, in fact, the vast majority of that money, was not self-employment income. What she claimed was that only the money that related to the percentage of time she spent writing the book would qualify as self-employment income. And her accountant had computed that for the first year, it worked out to something just over 16% of her time was related to actual writing time. They kind of worked up a time screen of how long it took her to write and how much time she spent, the number of books she did that year, you know, how many projects did she do, how much writing did she do. And in the second year, it was a bit higher, but still nowhere near over half of it. So again, a small portion of her time spent on actual writing, and they only took the amount she was paid, the million she was paid each year, and multiplied it by that much smaller percentage. And that was all she claimed as self-employment income. And she claimed the other stuff was other income related to her publicity work, related to her work, uh, related to uh, what she was, you know, related to the use of her name, her likeness, right, her characters, and that none of that should be self-employment income to her. The tax court didn't agree, and neither now does the 11th Circuit on essentially the same exact terms as the tax court disagreed. And the 11th Circuit said, here's your problem. First, they said, she said, well, look, the promotion, it, it's not, you know, it, it's not the sort of uh, regular and continuous involvement. My, my work on promotion fails to meet that test. Well, the court had a number of problems with that argument. One problem they had with it, it was very obvious, was, wait, you're telling me that six, something you only do 16% of your time, apparently, you say, is regular and continuous. But this other stuff that makes up over 80% of your time is not. They said that very definition, if that 16% is regular and continuous and it's a trade or business, then this other stuff is part of it, too. You can't say your income that you claim is related to promotion or to your name or whatever at least, you know, and this, I guess, mainly promotion you're talking about at this point, said you cannot show, you know, you can't claim that that's not a trade or business. So we're not going to allow this theory. They said also, Karen, you claim deductions that are clearly related to your promotional stuff, you know, for like trips, you know, airfares, renting cars, et cetera, to go places and promoter books, you know, be on TV, right? Do those things, do those interviews, go out for the book signings and all of that sort of stuff. You're claiming those as business expenses. That also is counter to your claim that that stuff's not trade or business. If that's not, then those deductions aren't allowed, right? The only way you get those deductions is they relate to a trade or business. And if they relate to a trade or business, then what you're paid for doing that stuff is trade or business income under 1402A. And secondly, she said, okay, but what, what about like using my name and using my likeness, right? And my characters and all of that. Aren't, isn't that really, I mean, I'm not doing anything there, right? I'm doing nothing there. Isn't that not SE income? The court said, no, you, you kind of misunderstand the point here. Under 1402A, 
The definition of self-employment income is essentially any income that relates to a trade or business carried on by the taxpayer. And the catch, the court said, is it doesn't have to be income directly related to a specific activity, you know, where it's like obviously using her name. Somebody using her name does not require her to do anything, right? They, they could just use her name. But the court said that that's not the test. The test is, does that money you're getting for use of your name have sufficient nexus? And I actually use the term nexus, which is interesting outside the state tax concept. But does it have sufficient nexus or connection to the income that's coming from writing books? And what the court concluded was, None of this income would exist if you weren't writing books. And if you stop writing books, rapidly you would stop getting paid for doing this work. They're not going to publish more books. You know, if all that writing stops and dries up, these funds, they may not go away immediately, but they would definitely start declining. So essentially, you know, write, this is all part of income coming off of the fact that you're writing books. That writing books is what's driving the income. And for that reason, the entire millions that you received on your two publishing contracts are considered self-employment income. In essence, I think a lot of CPAs would have kind of leaned toward thinking this theory sounds great. And, you know, we, we should go down that path. And, yeah, that's what it is because all the other stuff is essentially being payment for goodwill type assets and things like that and use of those goodwill assets. And that wouldn't be self-employment income because she's not doing anything. But that's not how 1401A reads. And the problem is too many of us, and I've seen this before, and I see it when I talk to my staff and I talk to other people over the years, is everybody seemed to have learned this as a rule and never has ever looked at 1402A to figure out for sure what the definition of self-employment income is. You know, yes, be, you know, it's not, there's really no direct tie between doing something for every dollar of income that comes in. And the obvious example would be, let's say that I run a candy store, a retail candy store. So we get boxes of chocolates in, box of other stuff that goes up on the shelf. I have staff I hire to do sales work, etc. Well, I'm not necessarily performing services for every dollar that comes in, but every dollar is still going to be self-employment income. Okay, same basic issue here. So Karen lost again, right? So, you know, you might, you might feel sorry for her and decide to go out and buy one of her books this weekend or this week. You know, j just read one of her books to try to help her pay her tax bill and her attorney's bill because I'm sure the attorney's fees won't be cheap for this either. Okay, coming up, I do have courses coming up. August 19th, 20th, and 21st in Arizona. They'll be both in person at the Phoenix office of the Arizona Society and also webcast. So you can take it either way. I know that there is currently, you know, it depends on how you feel about things that are happening now. But yes, it's offered fully as a webcast, just like it always has been. Uh, we did that before the pandemic. So on the 19th, I'll be talking about the income taxation of trusts and estates. On the 20th, I'll be talking about the uh, assisting survivors, the CPA's role in the scenes of states, and I shouldn't say the 21st. It's actually going to be Monday the 23rd. They've actually got me split over a weekend. I'll be talking about partnership and LLC taxation, advanced issues. That will include the BBA audit regime, since we apparently really need to review that because every time I bring it up, people are totally shocked that amended returns are a big problem now because of that if you didn't opt out or you just can't opt out. So we'll talk about that. Otherwise, I'll see you guys back here next week. We may have the uh, at least the first infrastructure bill there is a possibility. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, did say that she would bring the House back into session from August recess as soon as the Senate sends over legislation for her to work with. And she'd also said she won't do it until they pass the a big $3.5 trillion spending program that's part of the reconciliation package. So my guess is the Senate has to clear both of those. I suspect the Senate will want to clear them relatively quickly to get out of town. They don't like staying around. And then the House would come back. And obviously, House coming back is is great for the Senate if they don't change anything. But if the House changes anything, then we'd have been conference committee. And so, yeah, Senate could be around for a while. So we'll see how it goes. But if we get those bills, we'll talk about what's in them. I would expect the major league tax materials to be in the reconciliation bill. Not, you know, there's still there's a couple of things only in the 
bipartisan infrastructure bill. There are way more potential tax deals that will come up in the big bill. So, But if those bills come out, we will talk about them and see what's going on, at least to do a basic review of them here. And probably I'll be doing a few courses on the topic once we actually have a bill. So we'll see how it goes up. But otherwise, you know, take care. I am, as I say each week, I do monitor uh, the discussions on the Connect groups for the Arizona Society, uh, New Jersey Society of CPAs, Minnesota, uh, Illinois, Washington, and I'm also monitoring the discussion groups that are run by Idaho. And I post some stuff there so you can check there. If you have questions, you can post them there. Otherwise, like I say, I will see you guys back here next week as we go through more current federal tax developments.